Welcome to the Produce Performance Podcast, where we feature our customers, their businesses, who they train, and how they train them. Hey, everybody, I'm your host, Will Waterman, Head of Human Performance and Sports Science at Produce Motion. And boy, we have a big one for you guys today. We have the man, the myth, the legend, Eric Cressy. I've been really looking forward to this one for a long time. Uh, for those that don't know, Eric is president and co-founder of Cressy Sports Performance with facilities in Hudson, Massachusetts. Massachusetts and Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. He has worked with clients from youth sports to professional and Olympic ranks, but is best known for his extensive work with baseball players. He has more than 100 professional players that train with him each off season, which is just incredible. And that just shows you what, you know, how, how prolific this man is with working with baseball. He also serves as director of player health and performance for the New York Yankees, which as of this recording, I think they have the second best record in the league and they're topping the American league right now. And Cressy has authored over 1000 articles, published six books and co-created seven video resources that have been sold in over 60 countries around the world. He's also lectured in six countries and more than 25 states. And his research has been published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. So prolific writer, author, and creator of content. I've been following Eric for a long, long time personally. When I first started working with Proteus, he was an early target of mine that I was like, man, I really wanna get this in front of him. If he can see what we can do, I think he'll be impressed. And uh, you know, we talked a little bit about that, but it was one of those things where we showed it to him, it went really well, and, and you could tell the gears were turning immediately. So uh, obviously a big moment for us, and you know, and he's been, and someone that's kind of understood and been involved from a very early stage of Proteus. And so we've, we've done a lot of cool things with him and partner with him, you know, and, and even brought some things into the product itself based on some of the work we've done together. So it's a really great episode. He goes into a lot of depth about his background and about his training philosophies and of course, how he uses Proteus. So sit back and enjoy someone with, you know, has a lot of great things to say, get your notepads out and start writing. Here's Eric Cressy. Okay, the great Eric Cressy. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for making the time. You got it. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. I mean, I, you know, as soon as we decided to start a podcast, you know, of, of course, everyone in the uh, at Proteus was like, we have to get Eric, you know, we want him to be one of our first guests. And uh, so, you know, thank you so much for taking the time. Where are you coming? Where are you talking to us from today? Uh, I'm in uh, I'm at a hotel in Boston, actually. We're playing the Red Sox this weekend. So kind gotcha. of a mini road trip for me. Yeah, man. Well, you know, you know, we've been obviously we've known you for a couple of years, uh, you know, been working with you for a couple of years. But, you know, I think a lot of the people that we talk to, you know, uh, either heard of Proteus because of you or, uh, you know, you know, definitely your word on kind of, you know, w you know, what's good out there. Uh, and, you know, what kind of technologies and equipment and stuff, you know, goes a long way. But, you know, something I don't think I've heard a lot because I, I listen to your podcast, but I'd kind of like to, you know, turn the tables and learn more about you because I, you know, I know a little bit about your backstory, but I don't think necessarily, you know, a lot of your listeners necessarily know your background as, uh, as well. So I'd love to kind of flip the tables and have you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got into this business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a little bit of a long and winding road. I actually started out actually thinking I was going to be an accountant. Uh, got put to play uh, soccer and tennis in college and um, thought I was going to be a bean counter. I had a bunch of them in my family. I didn't know, and, see, I didn't know that yeah, already. We're yeah, already off to a good start. New yeah, stuff. so I went to Babson College, which is kind of known for its, its entrepreneurial studies. Um, and I figured that, you know, I could kind of focus on the accounting side of things underneath that um, entrepreneurial umbrella, kind of always had a little bit of an entrepreneurial experience, you know, growing up, I, you know, I worked at a local tennis club and strung rackets and, you know, did some stuff on that, on that front, but, um, got to school and it actually coincided. I, I had some health problems, um, also had kind of a bum shoulder and that kind of pushed college sports to the wayside for me. But what it really did do is you know, kind of accidentally gave me a self lesson and, you know, how to train, how to eat right, all that stuff. And realized pretty quickly that I was a lot more passionate at that age about 
you know, the training side of things than I was about just, you know, studying, you know, accounts receivables and things like that. So after my sophomore year, I transferred to the University of New England, um, wound up doing a double major in exercise science and sports management, uh, went on to do to grad school at the University of Connecticut, not really knowing um, what I wanted to study. It was almost a little one of those like, hey, let's give me two more years to figure this out. Um, so when I got to school, I, I took organic chemistry with about 300 UConn undergrads and quickly realized that I did not want to go the research route, even <laughs> though um, my grad assistantship there was, was actually you know, funded largely in research. Um, and then uh, just was fortunate to, to you know, cross paths with Brajesh Patel, a uh, great strength coach who was there at the time doing his master's. And he invited me just to come by the weight room one day. Actually, it was one morning at like 5.30 a.m. for men's baseball conditioning and saw how Brajesh did his thing and just really fell in love with strength conditioning. And uh, so I volunteered in, on, on the varsity strength conditioning side of things at, at UConn uh, during my couple of years there. Actually, most of my work there was, was basketball, soccer, um, you know, some field hockey, a little bit of football, a little bit of, uh, you know, baseball as well. But mm -hmm. um, went to the private sector for a little bit and um, eventually moved up to Boston and it just so happens some of the uh, the first guys that I worked with were baseball players. Um, mm -hmm. you know, high school guys became college guys, college guys became pro guys. Um, you know, you realize it was a very underserved population in the context of strength conditioning. And, um, you know, it, it allowed us to kind of, you know, initially very accidentally develop this, this niche in the baseball community, because back in, you know, 2006, 2007, there weren't these like really, really targeted baseball facilities. You know, there are mm. places where you went to hit in the cages and throw bullpens, but none of them were really doing strength conditioning in the same place. So we, we you know, kind of put them together. Um, I was joked, I took some, you know, from the powerlifting community that I competed in. I took something from college strength conditioning, tried to take something from the actual skill development world, and right. then put, put them all together and CSP was born. Um, and here okay. we are now, you know, 15 years later, I actually celebrated our 15th anniversary at the Massachusetts facility this year. Uh, oh man, congrats. Thank you. Uh, 2014, we opened the Florida location. Um, so we have two facilities in two states. Um, we train guys from all 30 major league organizations. Um, we get NFL quarterbacks, we get tennis players, we get golfers. Um, and we have rehab components with physical therapists on site, um, massage therapy. We mm -hmm. you know, kind of check a lot of boxes and it's also led to, you know, some opportunities to consult and do different things for, for gym owners and other realms. And kind of do some some angel investing and some advising for companies and then um you know as i alluded to earlier my other my other full-time job is um i serve as director of player health and performance for the yankees so i i wear a, a few different hats uh depending busy on busy guy you're, man yeah. you're just a busy guy and actually hey that's kind of, it's funny kind of a common uh we have one other common thing that i didn't realize I also did accounting for a little bit in college. Really? I hated it, man. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I think it's, I, I'm really good at math and I feel like accounting is more of a language rather than math. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I think I always appreciated the, um, like the, this sounds terrible to say the lack of creativity involved. Like it was very <laughs> black and white. Like I was that yeah. kid in high school. Like, you know, you had to have like an art credit, like senior year, second semester. Right. I, was, <laughs> I was taking art with a bunch of freshmen because I had no interest in doing anything. <laughs> oh, like that. Man. Um, but yeah, I went to the main state accounting championship. My, my senior oh. year. Yeah. Just, Oh, one, wow. One so of those yeah, one of those trophies that's really prominently displayed on the mantle <laughs> to this day, right next to my powerlifting trophy. That's that's hilarious. <laughs> it it literally remains, I think, my worst grade I got post like may, maybe ever mm -hmm. was was it was accounting. So, um, well, see, you know, uh, I really it's quite a journey and a lot of different <laughs> things that you're up to, and you're obviously you're a really really busy guy. But I think it, you know, to me, something I've always been intrigued by was your training philosophies. And I guess I want to know, like, when did it, when did it dawn on you or kind of what was like the, you know, impetus for kind of made you realize you need to train baseball players di more, you know, differently than how they were being trained already? Like, what was yeah. it that was sticking out to you that was kind of wrong with the, uh, the paradigm that you kind of saw as, uh, you know, a way to uh, something to fix and uh, improve? Yeah. I don't know if it was ever like one specific moment where I was like, this is the day, but I think it was almost like death by a thousand paper cuts, you know, like yeah, yeah. I, I do remember like a, you know, a kid from a local high school who had played for the, you know, this, you know, this coach had been there for 30 years and he's like, Oh, you don't ever need to use anything more than 15 pounds. And that's just for wrist curls. I'm like, all right. So we, we don't believe in lifting. Um, <laughs> you know, that was an issue. And then, you know, the further you get along, you see these guys who are just distance running till the cows come home. And, and from a, just a purely like logical standpoint, like, 
I mean, specificity always wins. You right. know? It's like the right. one thing we probably can all agree about um, in the context of like health and human performance is you get what you train, right? Don't expect to be mm-hmm. an elite sprinter if you train like a marathoner. You know, don't expect to be 5% body fat if you eat terribly. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Um, and that was something that, you know, I, I just tried to take a logical approach to it. Um, so I think that's what probably led me or led me in that direction. I, I will say for me, it probably helped that I had a bum shoulder from my tennis career. And, and mm. so I was probably able to speak the language a little bit faster, but the funny part was we never like really set out to be a baseball specific, like training. So like I was training, like, you know, triathletes, marathoners, I had, mm. um, some NFL combine prep guys. Um, I had done a ton of stuff in basketball and soccer, like I had mentioned, and it was funny because we we saw our business becoming you know very baseball focused basically in, in 2007 um we had you know kind of four athletes from a high school in massachusetts one of them won state player of the year you know all of them became good you know college players they won the state championship and my phone just started ringing off the hook and and i don't remember it but my business partner pete was like it was a very like compelling moment in our business like we had like a staff meeting where apparently we were talking about like diversifying and trying to make sure that we got people in from like other walks of life so that you know the facility wasn't empty during baseball season and i was like well, why don't we just double down on on baseball and <laughs> it, apparently you know everybody like did like this aha and we did it i don't even remember saying it <laughs> but you know here we are now and it's it's you know you know if you go to our florida facility like 49 percent of our revenue is major league baseball players right um, off season whereas you know I just, I, I don't even, it doesn't even occur to me. And if you walk in there, man, it is yeah. like basically a who's who. I mean, I mean, yeah. I've definitely, I've gone in there with, yeah. uh, you know, especially some people that are like, you know, yeah. big time MLB got, you yeah. know, fans and stuff. They go in there like, oh my God, half this place yeah. is just crawling with uh, it, MLB talent. So it's kind of like uh, we joked during the lockout, it was like the ESPYs just because you right. had a lot of those guys that were there longer and the NFL is off season. They got to go and get some, right. some pro golfers and tennis players around. And <laughs> it was, um, it was a lot of fun, but you know what? Like I, the guys appreciate that they can, they can be themselves. I, I think that right. really goes a long way. And, and the nature of where we are, like, you know, in Palm Beach County, people are kind of used to seeing like Tiger Woods and Starbucks and yeah, you know, yeah. celebrities everywhere. <laughs> so they can kind of let their guard down a little bit. Just yeah. One of the boys. Well, so, so actually I'd love to dive in a little bit more on the philosophy. Do, do, are there any like major tenets that you can kind of share with people that you, you know, I, I hate to say things that are like, you know, too dogmatic, but, you know, certain things like, I I know that you're big on unilateral training. I know that you're big on, you know, on the strength speed spectrum, you, you know, you, 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 something you've said that I learned, picked up from you. I started following your work a long time ago, uh, even as a physical therapist, but, you know, the whole concept of that you can develop, uh, there's a point where developing too much strength becomes, you know, a, a problem in a way, like you're, you're really not really benefiting yourself to kind of keep chasing, like say a really heavy deadlift or something like yeah. that. So can you give us some of those little nuggets and things that yeah. people can kind of, kind of, uh, you know, take home? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's hard to, to summarize an entire training philosophy, like, in, sure. you know, the nuts and bolts of it. But I, I, I do think, you know, if you, if you take a step back and get less granular, you can, you can always say it always comes down to individualization. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, we, we, we simplify things to excess um, and mm-hmm. that can be a problem. And, and what, the, what do you wind up getting? You get one program on a dry erase board that, you know, 20 mm-hmm. different athletes are all doing. And we've always tried to be the opposite of that. We've, we tried to heavily individualize and we want to be in a position where athletes feel like we're a competitive advantage for them and that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the programs are very much catered to exactly what they need. So, you know, that's where some of these discussions about the force velocity curve and, and then how you, you, you know, interact with it um, in various ways with your training. Um, you know, I, I'm very, very careful with how I phrase the um, like the discussion of like how much strength is too much a, because like, being very candid like I, I have a powerlifting background like I've yeah you know I've deadlifted 660 like at, at 165 <laughs> like the, like I'm very emotionally attached to lifting heavy things yeah um, yeah yeah and, and part of being a coach is being you know emotionally detached from from what it is you enjoy and more about yeah. what you need to do for your athletes so um what, what I know about powerlifting is it, it taught me a lot about how few people really have ever understood how to like really attack like even not not just a training max or you know certainly not a competition max is you know like j- j- not to go on a little tangent but like every sunday morning for literally like two years of my life like 
I got out of bed. I drove to Southside, you know, gym. And at 165, I trained right alongside a bunch of guys who were 900 plus pound squatters. Like I oh, wow. just, I mean, rust and spit and sweat, like <laughs> just loading and unloading plates. Like you, yeah. it was lace basically lift or die. Um, and it was, it was honestly, it was the best thing for me. Like I, I'd come home on uh, every Sunday and I'd have blood vessels that were bursted in my eyes and you know you'd, you'd be just there was no air conditioning so you'd like need to change shirts like four times on the ride home it was oh. it was a rough neighborhood but like what it made me realize is in spite of the fact that i had had some success in training you know i had never sniffed an eight out of above an eight out of ten you know like and and you know these really high level athletes who find nines who find tens yeah um and, and those are the days when you you like, you want to go home and like curl up on the couch and watch the same episode of sports center, like seven times in a row. Like that's how tired you are. Yeah. And, and I, I learned to have a lot more of those. And it was at a point in my training career, I was you know, 25, 26 when yeah. I could do that, you know, you could bounce 41. Now it's a lot harder to do it, but you know, it allowed me to tap into a higher level of, you know, neural efficiency, particularly as a lightweight lifter, mm -hmm. um, because I didn't have a lot of cross-sectional air to fall back on. And it, it was very, very impactful for me. And what it means in the context of this discussion is I do think before we have that discussion about getting like very particular with where we are in that force velocity curve, you, you've got to have force. And the problem right. is a lot of athletes never develop force because they never make a really concerted run at it, you know, over a consistent amount of time to get to that point. And that's usually, you know, your first two years of college training, conditioning, these guys put yeah. you know, 200, 200 pounds on their squat, they put on 20, 25 pounds, you know, in the baseball world, it's what takes them from 88 to 93. And you have to do that. And, and what we have is we have a generation of athletes who unfortunately sometimes haven't sniffed above a four. And if we really look at people who've had a lot of long-term success in strength conditioning. They, they have tons of sixes and sevens. Like mm. they know how to go in and get a training effect without absolutely like destroying themselves in the weight room. But they do build that foundation with, with a lot of the basics. And I, I don't think we can overlook that. I can't tell you how many high school kids I've seen who, you know, you get them to like a 405 for five trap bar deadlift and all of a sudden they start hitting home runs and throwing 90. It's, mm -hmm. to me, it's very mundane. Anybody can do it. But, um, you know, that's something I've learned. With that said, this is where you have these discussions about your more advanced athletes um, because there are, you know, a collection of them that, that stall out. And that's the best mm. way I can define it. We, we see a lot yeah. of kids. I use like the, the division one example. They go to a weight room. It's a bunch of power racks, a bunch of dumbbells. Like they don't throw the med balls. There's no like cables. There's certainly no Proteus, like nothing, nothing triplanar. Exactly. So, you know, that what they get from a triplanar standpoint is, is throwing a baseball, you know, and right. it's probably the most extreme example because it's triplanar with a, a five ounce implement. Um, yes. So um, where we've had a lot of success is taking a lot of those kids that are, you know, tapped out. They're the juniors, the seniors in college who, who aren't responding to the same program as the freshmen and sophomores are. They're the guys who have been at, you know, big time division one programs and they get to pro ball and they just have been underserved, whether it's in the actual training side of things with, you know, how we train rotation and how we rediscover rotation they may have lost. And it may also be on the, the true skill development side of things, understanding like spin axis on four seams and, you know, why their pitches profile, you know, the way they do, why they may not be sequencing correctly. And then certainly how all these physical competencies fit with their delivery. Because we certainly see people who, you know, are Proteus rock stars who get yeah. on the mound and they, they do everything wrong with our, their delivery. And so they're not translating, you know, what, what we think is a very specific mode of training into right. you know, an actual athletic outcome. So specificity always wins. You know, yeah, no, I, I love it. And, and by the way, I, uh, I can already say that I, uh, I, 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 there's a guy when I, I actually did Olympic weightlifting in mm -hmm. college or actually in grad school and I was in PT mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. and there was a guy like you who was smaller than me uh but was and i'm too tall to let's let's all be clear i have the worst frame for olympic lifting but there was this guy smaller than me and he was kind of like my rival he was also a cairo you know and i'm a pt yeah. he's a cairo so we already had a little beef and then he uh he could lift more than me and he was skinnier and smaller and i was just like god just drove me nuts you know what i mean to have this guy that was so like you said neurologically dense yeah. but the, the the dude could just get it you know yeah. um and, and so like, I totally understand that aspect and I could see how that power lifting background of creating that can, or for any of these athletes is, is valuable. I really yeah. appreciate that four out of 10, you know, kind of yeah. concept. And, uh, you know, that's definitely yeah. something, you know, from Olympic lifting and actually also cycling for me where I could, I've, I've seen it where I've gotten to the, to the, yeah. to the high end, but what do you, what are there other kind of, um, 
you know, other than powerlifting, are there other big influences on kind of your, your thinking, you know, other schools of thought or other things that have really, that have kind of leaked its way into the kind of the philosophy? Yeah. You know, I think you, you'd be influencers. Lot, certain yeah. People, yeah. Know? Yeah. I would say there's, there's certainly a, a collection of different, um, you know, methodologies out there. I, I think, you know, in the baseball realm, you know, there's a study that came out years ago that showed that 57% of pitchers have a shoulder injury each year, you know, of some sort of mm. soreness and actual, you know, IL stint surgery or whatever it is. And you mix in elbows, you mix in necks, you know, you're going to see some blisters, some finger issues, you know, right. just, and that's just the upper extremity, you know, thoracic outlet. Um, and what you quickly realize is that if you're not borrowing from the rehab community, you have to. So I'd, I'd say, you know, our, our, you know, we have some massive influences there. I, I was lucky in grad school, Dave Tiberio um, was on my, my thesis committee. So I was mm. able to take some classes with him. So I, you know, it's kind of like a, a derivative of Gary Gray's work that influenced right. me. Um, like certainly Posture Restoration Institute has been big, um, you know, uh, SFMA, FMS, both outstanding, um, you know, so, I think there's, there's a million different ways that you can get better. I, I'd say probably on the, on the, you know, the other thing is we, we were big on manual therapy. So things like fascial manipulation, dry needling, um, instrument assisted stuff. You know, I, I think all this stuff is maybe, maybe poorly understood of why it works to some degree, right. but we do know that it makes a big difference in the way we train people. So there have been a, a host of different methodologies that, that, um, you know, kind of impact you. The thing I come back to is, is right now we, you know, and this is not to sound like, you know, overly confident, but we've had good success, right? The, the right. business wouldn't be where it is if we hadn't had results. And I think what's really easy to do, you know, particularly for younger coaches in the industry is you, you go to a new course and all of a sudden you come back and you want to overhaul everything you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, <laughs> I certainly us, have done, I've certainly yeah. done that before even as a PT. So yeah. I get it. Yeah. And, but now, you know, now I go to a course or we bring somebody in or something like that. And, you know, it, we have a candid conversation as a staff. It's like, Hey, what, what does this mean for our philosophy? Let's all talk about this together. Um, because you don't just want it to be correct. You want it to be scalable. So mm -hmm. as an example, um, you know, basically Dan Swinsco is a good friend, a PT, um, just relocated from Seattle to Arizona. Dan's done a great job in the sandbag realm. And he came okay. to, to Florida, actually it was like, like in December of 2019, it was right before COVID hit, but um, did an, uh, an in-service for our staff, um, just on how sandbags work. And to be honest, I hadn't used a lot of sandbags. You know, I, I knew Josh Hankin, great dude, met with him on the Perform Better tour and I knew Boyle had started doing it, but you know what, I, I, I wanted to experience it before we really started rolling this out. And, and sure enough, like, brought in some different things and it's like hey this is a this is something that we can utilize it can build on what we've already done it's a progression like there are ways when maybe we can get, make our warm-ups more engaging add a little external load we can attack rotation a little bit more and then all of a sudden once sandbags are there you're starting to realize all right we, we can do a lot of this stuff with aqua bags you know we got a lot of hyper mobile guys we can we can challenge them in different ways so you, you realize like that when you have these discussions and you, you get out of your comfort zone you bring in smart people to challenge you with with new principles and things like that you can always you know it leads to great conversations with your your, your peers and um you can, right. you can build something better but you never throw in the baby out with the bath water you know what i mean it's like mm -hmm. it's, you know pe people ask like you know where does pri fit in like PRI is an amazing framework through which we view asymmetry and whether it may be excessive or normal, you know, it can, it can do some really great things for helping us to get people closer to neutral. But at the end of the day, if you come and you watch like our, our actual programs, it's probably three to 4% of the overall training session. Right. Right. Um, and it's an impactful three to 4%, but it doesn't mean we're going to stop deadlifting. It doesn't right. mean like we're throwing out all our med balls or anything like that. Like, and, and I think that's what the, you know, the, the young coach nowadays, it's just so easy to get overwhelmed and you know, kind of have shiny object syndrome when you pop on Instagram and you see the latest and greatest craziness. Yeah, no, nah, totally. I, I, I totally respect that. And it's, I feel like all the best practitioners I've ever met are people that pull a lot from a lot of different philosophies and then yeah. kind of make their own kind of amalgam of, of all those different things put together. But a lot of them have obviously a lot of, uh, similarities and maybe this their approach is the same thing it is or it's just slightly different you know um so you know actually given that kind of describe to the listeners what your you know general screens and you know assessments are like at, at your facility yeah i'd say uh, first and foremost there's always a, lo a level of pre-screening that takes place and i think that's vitally important because you know i'm not the only one on our staff who's doing assessments you know, what do I get? a lot of, like, you know, the complex, you know, medical cases, you know, a lot of the advanced athletes, you know, things like that. Whereas, 
you know, some of our younger staff maybe get the, you know, the 14 year old kid with no training experience who just needs to have like a, a great relationship with exercise and, and build a solid foundation. So, you know, our, our administrative staff, you know, both in Massachusetts and Florida does a really good job of pre-screening, like, you know, people may send radiology reports ahead of time, things like that, just so we know that they're matched up with the right coach. Um, and then certainly um, there, there may be scheduling with, you know, parallel fields. So they might want to get treatments with our massage therapist or see our physical therapist or, you know, do pitching instruction or hitting instruction, whatever it is. So there's a lot of different parts that have to fit together. And my, my wife, Anna, and my business partner, Pete, are the ones that kind of orchestrate the chaos with all that. Um, but once we actually start, always begin with a like a you know, pretty meticulous health history, looking at everything from, you know, obviously injury history to, you know, having conversations about like what's worked, what hasn't. Um, certainly look at uh, one that I think it's overlooked a lot is like medications, you know, are they on beta blockers, statins, mm -hmm. Accutane, any of that stuff, you want to be really, really mindful of, of not missing out on stuff, because that certainly impacts the process. Um, and it's really just a discussion in the office to get things rolling, um, so that we can set them up for success. Um, we'll stay in the office, usually do some, in, in the case of males, uh, shirtless posture screens um, that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll document, we usually do you know, shoulder abduction, flexion, ER, um, with the arms adducted, look at a toe touch, um, look at a push-up progression. Um, we will look at, you know, SFMA cervical screens. We usually do some manual muscle testing for the rotator cuff, um, like the single leg balance that you'll see in SFMA takes place in the office as well. And then we'll head out on the floor where it's a little more convenient obviously to put their shirt back on. And then we'll do like our table assessments um, with, you know, upper and lower extremity screens just for range of motion. Um, we'll look at in for sternal angle, lumbar locked rotation tests, uh, mm -hmm. both active and passive, um, overhead lunge walk, overhead squat, um, you know, a, a variety of different movement screens, both general and specific once they're out there, ankle mobility. And then once they're done with that, what we'll do is we'll, we'll write up a warm up for them on their first day, um, mm -hmm. you know, basically in accordance with the results of, you know, what we saw in that evaluation. And then we'll actually do the Proteus power test. Um, so basically, you know, hit that and, um, you know, depending on time of year, like you might not roll that out on an athlete that's in season where you don't want to, you know, beat them, beat them up a day out from a game or something like that. But, sure. um, that's a, that's a crucial one for all our, you know, off season onboarding for our pro guys and, um, all that. So that gives us a little bit of a, an insights into some of the, the ways that they create power. Um, you know, depending on the scenario, we, we may do some additional, you know, tests where, you know, it's a vertical jump or, you know, a broad jump or something to that effect. Right. Um, in, the, in the case of, you know, pitching and hitting, we usually have some, some metrics, whether it's hit tracks, Rapsodo, um, any of that who can give us a little bit more insights on the actual, you know, specifics of how they work. Nice, man. I mean, hey, for all you guys listening and, and gals, that was that's a lot of stuff, you know what I mean? But that's a yeah. lot of good stuff, man. You guys are really looking at the big picture. Uh, I can see already why people, you know, travel to go see you, man. That's, that's very yeah. comprehensive. <laughs> and, and the secret too, is that it has to be, um, you know, heavily documented. That's, that's the right. one thing, you know, we, we, we do see a, you know, a significant volume of athletes over the two facilities and, you know, some of them are more transient. They might come to town for a sure. week and try to get a crash course and, you know, and then you're going to watch over them, you know, remotely in many cases. So you want to make sure that you've got the information documented really, really well. Um, so you can, you can you know, deliver what you're, you're hoping for in the, in the follow-up work. Right, right. And so you can actually measure and see if it's changing. And yeah. I, I'm sure it's a, everything you just said, I, like, I can't imagine remembering all of that for like, you know, one person, you know, you know, yeah. putting that to memory versus, you know, having it for, you know, you know, 50 p people in my care or something. So yeah. uh, I, I, I totally appreciate that. Well, you know, you know, part of that, obviously, you mentioned was the Proteus test. And how did Proteus kind of come into the facility originally? I mean, obviously, I remember going there mm -hmm. and doing the first demo, uh, brought our CEO, uh, Sam mm -hmm. and I came and, and gave you a demo of it. But kind of what what was before that? What what was the, yeah, help, help me remember kind of how the, we got the into lead this. in. Uh, so it was actually, um, it was one of those things where I, I kind of like heard about Proteus through, through a number of different avenues. I knew that you guys were trying to get in touch with me and it was kind of like during a crazy time. And it actually came through, through Sahil Bloom, one of our, uh, you know, retired right. athletes he played at baseball at Stanford and was in the private equity realm out in California. And, and I believe um, one of his, his peers, um, Dick was, was an investor. Um, That's right. Proteus, who reached out to Sahil and was like, Hey, can you help to get this in front of Eric? And um, from there uh, put us in touch. And, and to be honest, 
and I, I've given honest feedback to to Will and Sam on this. Like, so be honest, the web the website was horrific. It oh was, yeah, it was, it was it was Boston bad. Foundation. It looked like my seven year old daughter did it. Like <laughs> the the branding was bad. Like everything yep. about it was like not at all representative of how not at all it was. And that's why I was probably so slow to come around. Those guys have joked about it. So um, yeah. And but totally. But sure enough, um, to you guys, to your credit, you guys threw it in a moving truck, drove it up from New York, <laughs> set it up in New York, or excuse me, in Boston, did a, uh, you know, basically a demo for, for me and the rest of our staff at our Massachusetts facility. And that's when you start to see it. You realize yeah. that, you know, the potential is there once you can have it in your hands um, and check in on it. And, and I think what, you know, my first you know, thought was going, all right, is this a very objective measure that we can use for return to play on things like, you know, cuff injuries and rotator cuffs, you know, uh, uh, excuse me, and um, like oblique strain, stuff like that. Um, and at, once I actually felt it, it was more like, all right, this is something we can actually use to train power. This is something that, that supplements our medicine ball work really, really well. Um, and then to be honest, like the power test idea didn't even come out that day. I think I was so fascinated by the feel of it and the nature of the technology yeah. that I never bothered to think that, hey, if we, we sequence a collection of these screens, that we could probably get more insights about, you know, not just the force created, but how that force is created. You know, are people elastic? Are they, you know, are they slow, strong? Um, right. That was, you know, really a testament to you guys for for digging in deeper once we kind of like brainstormed on it. And, um, you know, it's been it's been very cool to see how it's, you know, it's not just caught on, but where it's caught on. You know, like a lot of yeah. the, the private facilities that, you know, in some ways in, across the industry have modeled themselves after us. Um, and certainly, you know, more stuff happening in, in both college and professional sports. It's been, uh, it's been cool to see. And it's, you know, if, I wouldn't endorse it and I wouldn't be like invested on it if it didn't work. You know I mean? That's what yeah. it comes back to is, is like, this is an, an actual part of how we train athletes. And we do feel like it gives us and them a competitive advantage to get the results we need. Well, something you said, even, <clears throat> I don't know if it was the day we, you know, we met and we did the demo, it might've been like a follow-up or something, but I think you were the one that put this in my head yeah. first um, was that, you know, even compared to like, say a med ball, which I know you've been big on med balls for a long yeah. time, but the resistance from Proteus actually, you know, mirrors the direction yeah. of movement and truly. Just, right. You know, yeah. I think you, know, you, you go ahead. I think you always yeah. said that something about med ball and the difference between yeah. med ball and Proteus. You think about it, to be honest, if you throw a med ball, traditionally you load it more, the movement gets worse, right? Particularly rotationally because the, the force works up and down and mm -hmm. you're trying to produce force, you know, basically in the, the frontal and transverse planes, um, you know, you're trying to, to move laterally to a degree. Uh -huh. um, and, I, and I think that's the problem is the, the heavier you load a med ball, what happens? You wind up like leaking forward with your head and offsetting it and it, it actually implements or it impacts the pattern negatively. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Proteus, like, you know, it, it, it perfectly matches, you know, this, the strength curve, like where you're trying to for, put force into. So it allows you to probably train at different points on that, that force velocity curve without compromising the quality of movement. Um, and, and I think that's really, really big, but, you know, building on that, like probably a much later conversation when I had like my, my aha moment was like, you know, we, we have plenty of experience with force plates and, you know, mm -hmm. so they can tell you a lot about, you know, how you interact with the ground, how you may be applying force asymmetrically, but we know that they can be pretty tricky, particularly with pitchers with predicting performance, right? You, every, every pitcher does something a little bit differently. So a lot of those sagittal plane initiatives can be a little bit hairy um, mm -hmm. with respect to how we work. Like you're probably gonna get a lot more out of like golfers, um, hitters, um, just because we do know like vertical jump tends to correlate pretty highly with, with long drive distance. TPI has mm -hmm. done some great research on that. Um, and hitting is probably somewhat analogous. Pitching the amplitude is just so much bigger. There's so much more hip shoulder separation. Mm -hmm. You're attacking, you're getting way down the ground. So I think what we're realizing in these situations is that Proteus may be that bridge. It may, it may explain why these guys who have unbelievable force plate assessments don't throw hard um, beyond just, you know, the mechanics of, you know, how they impart force right. to the and all that stuff. You know, so I, I, I was joking around that, that Proteus is a rotational force plate. It just, it gets you closer Love to it. where the force is actually applied to the implant. And don't get me wrong, like you might get a great Proteus score and still throw 82 um, sure. because you're accidentally throwing, at, you know, cutters on every pitch when you're trying to throw a true, you know, four seam, but it's just given us more insights to be able to backtrack things. But Probably just as importantly, it's it's telling us what we need to do from a programming standpoint. You know, is this athlete right. enough? Are they, you know, are they, you know, just in need of more elasticity, whatever it may be? Yeah, and actually, that that brings me back to you know some of the testing. I know after we did, uh, you know, after we you know got a machine to your facility in, in Boston, and we did a study there, 
right? Mm -hmm. um, and I say Boston, but really Massachusetts, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, after we had it to your facility there, we did a study that we were looking at your, I think it was your summer, I don't remember which year it was. It was, yeah, it was, it was summer of 2020. Yeah, it's twenty. It actually, we didn't we didn't have it in twenty twenty, so it would have been probably twenty twenty one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. And we would, and all yeah. we did was you know measure before, um, you know, the beginning of their program and near the end. Yeah. And something that we, you know, obviously, I know you've you've talked about that study before that really looked at mm -hmm. um, one of the highest correlations to you know power out or to you know throwing velocity is more of a lateral bound yeah. had a much higher you know. Um, you know, correlation than I think even, even than a vertical jump. Right. And I can't remember which the, the, the author of that particular study, but something that you've, you've talked about yeah, before. And then your Graham podcast. Lehman. Yeah. Did yeah. a great study basically showed that, you know, lateral hop for distance and rotational med ball throw for distance predicted velocity. Whereas a lot of the, the classic sagittal plane, right. Vertical jump, broad jump, sprinting speed didn't seem to correlate nearly as high as they thought. Right. So, so kind of our thought was, okay, well, if that's true, let's take those concepts and put them in a Proteus test and assess them. Right. And the first thing that we saw when we did that, um, over that, that, you know, you know, uh, over the course of that time, a first off, we also looked at, you know, throwing velocity at the beginning of their program. And then we looked at the throwing velocity afterwards. And the first thing I got to say is, so everyone knows, uh, if you go train it, uh, with, uh, with Cressy, <laughs> Everything went up. I think the average was like four miles per hour or yeah. something crazy. It was like it's actually pretty years. consistent year to year. It's wild. Yeah, which is, like, but the, it was only like 12 weeks or something. Yeah. So yeah. It, anyways, uh, so kudos to you on the program. <laughs> but something that we've thought, found that was pretty interesting was that it wasn't that power correlated as high to uh, throwing velocity okay. on Proteus as acceleration did so our acceleration metric actually had a higher correlation to throwing velocity and then i re i remember at some point that you know we we presented these findings to you and some of the other staff and we we're like all right there's something here now maybe there's some way that we can kind of you know dissect this thing and say okay let's look at someone's power let's look at some acceleration and let's see kind of you know, which, which, where, where is someone on that uh, strength velocity, you know, force velocity yeah. spectrum based on those two things. And then I think that's when we kind of came up with, yeah. you know, in conjunction with you looking at power versus acceleration to yeah. kind of put them on this core, this, you know, spectrum and essentially came out with what we actually, you know, now, you know, kind of brand across all our systems as the Cressy, Cressy power report or C Cressy power test. Uh, and, it essentially does just that, right? We, we look at all the movements that you do, we average your power output and we average your acceleration output. And then we compare that person's output to the, uh, to, to their cohort. You can set a filter to say like, I want to compare it to just yeah. other major league players or, or whatever cohort you're working with. And we give you a percentile ranking for their power percentile ranking for their acceleration. We say, okay, if your acceleration is a lot higher than your power, let's go after that power. So that means you're going to be more, you need to work on more strength speed. You're more mm -hmm. speed dominant. And then we do the, obviously the opposite power is a lot higher than your acceleration. We say, okay, in that sense, we got to work on accelerations. So that's more speed strength. And, and I don't think we would have, you know, maybe would have gotten there at some point, but in, 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 in because of the work we did at your facility and working with you and within those concepts, that's kind of the, and your whole kind of philosophy of strength, speed, and kind of working that whole that whole spectrum. I don't think we would have gotten there if it wasn't for that study and working with you so closely uh, during that. So, like, it, can you speak at all to kind of any you know any more depth of that concept yeah. or any kind of direction uh, you know of where that's going? Yeah, absolutely. I think the acceleration, you know, just that phrase was was one that like kind of was a little bit of a light bulb moment over my head was. Um, you know, in baseball, one of the things that we realize is you'll see a lot of kids with, you know, very, very good arm speed who don't throw hard. I know that might seem weird or they don't throw strikes. Um, right. and it's a lot of athletes that, that chase early arm speeds. So they kind of like fly open and balls, you know, sail up an arm side. So imagine like a, a right-handed pitcher who's hitting like every right-handed batter in the shoulder. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's one of those things where they can't consistently execute what we would call a glove side fastball, throwing a ball down and away to a righty or into a lefty. Um, like it's, it's a long way to go. Um, and, and one of the reasons that this often happens is because they try to chase, you know, too much power early in their delivery instead of kind of just like letting things settle into place. 
so you know, and I've had some you know some good guests on my podcast that have talked about this. It's like you 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 can't generate velocity until front foot strike. So it's this this concept of like it's not just about being powerful; it's about producing that force and doing so quickly at the right times. Um, and I think that's where acceleration is is vitally important. Is we're not just chasing a peak power number; we're we're trying to apply that force in a really rapid window. So, in a, you know, if we're talking about pitcher, you know, that front foot gets time and it's time to go, right? Mm -hmm. so that's when, you know, pelvic velocity gets going and everything like just shifts up the chain to allow for like a clean layback. And it actually sets you up for a better delivery. When we see these guys who just like swing open and, you know, basically the, the front foot flies open and the arm is just dragging behind, like the front foot happens and they've got to like, they effectively have to yank to get there instead of just being in like this perfectly advantageous position to work aggressively. And, and there are different pitchers, you know, that do this differently. Like that's really mm -hmm. important to see, like, you know, particularly if you're familiar with like, concepts of like wide versus narrow and for sternal angles, like, you know, mm -hmm. your wide ISA guys are super hingy and they just like really have like this vertical shin and, and stay very like directional down the mound inside a narrow hallway. Whereas your, your narrow ISA guys often like collapse into their knee, get super rotational. Like everybody's a little bit different. Some of them will set up with ER versus IR bias on their back leg. So there, there's different ways to get the job done, but the principles of when you apply force are, are somewhat analogous. Like nothing really should happen prior to front, front foot strike. That's when it's time to go. Um, and then certainly there's, you know, there's parallels of what we see in, you know, hitting, you know, you're going to see it a little bit, obviously in golf as well. Right. Um, the, the timing of force application is, is what really, I think separates, you know, the, the really good athletes from the really good performers. Right. Right. And, and I think what's interesting, and I think it's hard for a lot of people to understand is, you know, power, power is a function of force times velocity, right? Yeah. So obviously you, you, the force aspect of what you're training, weightlifting, things like that, it's going to, uh, get there. And obviously velocity is a function of peak speed, right? So we're just talking there about peak speed. So that's what your power makes up your power. Whereas acceleration is how quickly you achieve that peak speed, yeah. right? So I think what Eric's really saying for, for everyone that it, for some people that I think this is confusing is that the acceleration component is, can you get to that peak velocity more quickly at yeah. the right time? Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so the interesting thing is when we can look at these numbers and we can say, okay, if your power is, you know, obviously, uh, you know, low, uh, but your acceleration is pretty good. That means you're getting to a peak velocity pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but you probably don't have the force side of the equation down. So we're going to go more of that strength speed, uh, but, you know, versus vice versa, right? You get someone with a high power number and they have that low acceleration, then it's the opposite, right? Like yeah. we, we got, you got to work on getting them to get to peak velocity earlier. And I believe for the most part with the athletes that you train, it's more on that latter example of they tend to have a higher power and a lower acceleration. Um, you know, it seems to be across what I see, you know, you know, across all of our, our installations that the majority of, of places uh, have athletes that have done a decent job, especially on the college level mm -hmm. uh, of developing good power. Yep. They don't necessarily have that acceleration component. So they end up being needing to bias more into that speed strength realm. And obviously it all depends on where they are in their periodization and where they are in the season and all this stuff, but do you find that people lack more, generally speaking, do you, do you agree with that? Or do you see that in, in your, with your um, clients that the issue tends to be more of a lack of speed strength versus strength speed? I, I think it depends on the age you're talking about. Like okay. at, the, at the professional level, yeah, you're, you know, professional advanced college, you're going to have more strong guys that probably need to train power. Don't, that's not, you know, a, yeah. you know it's a hard and fast rule because you'll, you'll see professional athletes that are, you know, shockingly weak. Um, and you'll also see high school kids who are, you know, who are brute strong, who need to train, you know, a lot more elasticity and things like that. So um, I don't think it's ever like, you know, perfectly 
you know, population specific, but um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, if I could speak to big picture things, it's that yes, the Proteus has helped us to realize that, you know, a lot of athletes are strong enough. And, and the best example I can give you is the 2020 season in major league baseball was a very short season. You know, those athletes basically trained all the way up until they reported July 1st and it was a 60 game season. So if you were an athlete that didn't really go in season, the 2020 season was two months, um, you know, right. closer to three when you figure in like summer camp and all that, but athletes really didn't detrain that, you know, even if they, so they just, came back just beastly, we had, we had multiple guys that came back and trap our <laughs> deadlifted like 500 on the first day of the office. Oh, wow. And what it forced me to do is like get super, super creative with a lot of them. And, and actually multiple ones of those guys came out and had career high VLOs in, in 2021, which to me was fascinating. Um, and I don't know if it was just that they were fresher coming off 2020. Right. The other thing is 2020 was a little bit deceiving. They were pitching with no fans in the stands. So baseball wide velocities you know, seem to have like that kind of correction without the adrenaline in play. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, it was a very like just fascinating training experience just because, you know, we quickly realized that we need to, we need to train power more frequently and a, across different points on this continuum. And, and Proteus was, was part of us being able to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and one other kind of aspect that we, I remember we brought into, you know, obviously the, the, the that new Cressy report that we, you know, did that's on our systems even today is looking at, and you mentioned the word elasticity, looking at someone's ability to generate power on a trunk rotation and comparing that to their ability to generate, and, and that's a static, you know, non-counter movement trunk rotation yeah. and comparing that to a counter movement, uh, you know, trunk rotation where they're allowed to kind of, you know, do a preload and then explode. Yep. Um, and the idea there is we wanted to say, hey, if your power output is less than 10, you know, in generally speaking, if you look at studies on vertical jumps, uh, if you do a static start vertical jump, so it's going to a squat, do a jump versus a counter movement jump, you're about, you should jump anywhere from 10 to 15% higher when you do the counter movement. So you get all that elastic component. Um, so we wanted to do the same thing for these different movements that just haven't been able to measure before. So we did that with a trunk rotation. And what we, you know, the idea is, if you don't produce that 10 to 15% more then you know, our argument you know, during the counter move, if you don't produce 10 to 15% more, then we want you to do more plyometric style or more kind of, you know, counter movement type of exercises to increase that free elastic re recoil that you get, you know, from the fascia and from that recruitment system, like, you know, in recruiting more, you know, fast twitch muscle fibers with that stretch reflex. Are, are you, are, are you guys doing that or using that um, or, or do you see that being valuable in any other areas of the body or either uh, are you taking that information and trying to use that in, in any other way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, I did this, believe it or not, all the way back in my master's thesis with respect to, you know, vertical jump stuff. You know, we looked at, oh, nice. well, and you look at count beyond just like the, the static versus the counter movement, you can look at like a bounce drop jump as a measure of the short stretch shortening cycle. So you have the short, short and long, um, which are different ground contact times. So you can take this as far as you want to go on this reactive, you know, slash elasticity index, but yeah, it's, it's, it's vitally important. Um, and it's, it's honestly, it's one of those things that's hard to really appreciate because I think, you know, we've always thought of just like muscular tendinous stiffness, you know, how, uh -huh. how an Achilles tendon works, but I don't necessarily think we appreciate these, these fascial contributions um, where, you know, sometimes we have these athletes that don't seem to be capable of remarkable forces. You know, I, I think, you know, if we're, if we're being honest about today's game, like Jacob deGrom is probably like the greatest example of, of all time, right? It's like, I don't think anybody would, would assume that deGrom is a weight room rock star. Um, you know, he's largely a guy who's like, really, really optimizes mechanics. He sprints, but doesn't carry a whole lot of muscle mass, you know, kind of loosey goosey, some, some hypermobility in play. And then he goes out and throws 103 and it's like, all right, what's happening here. Um, <laughs> it's probably a very well-tuned fascial system. And it's right. something that's maybe reconsidered this concept of like, you know, does mass really equal gas? Well, maybe not in everybody. Maybe right. some people rely so much on these you know, I don't know if you can even call them non-contractile elements. There has to be something. Yeah. You know, they're, they're elastic elements. Um, or, you know, maybe he's just one of these guys that neurologically is so yeah. efficient. He gets that, yeah. his transfer, his energy loss from like the ground yeah. up through his hand, yeah. you know, is just like, but there's, not, there's something, yeah. There. <laughs> there's something that has to transfer that in. there's, there's, you know, right. the, the tensegrity model, like has to support that. Um, so I think we're, we, we don't, we don't know that's taking place, you know, 
or we don't know why it's taking place. And right. I remember Sue, Sue Falson presenting on some, some research on like, you know, just like what actually is happening, you know, from, you know, bio, bio uh, chemistry level of like when we cup somebody or when we dry needle somebody, yeah. like there is, there are responses to, to the tissues. Right. Um, you know, there are people on like the internet who will tell you like manual therapy, like doesn't work. It's like, it's been on cave paintings for 5,000 years for a reason. <laughs> like these are, yeah. these are things that make people feel better and, and seem yeah. to help you know, people optimize performance in various ways, just because we don't like know why doesn't mean they're not favorably or unfavorably impacting how an athlete moves. Like I know when I go and I bench press really heavy, my neck feels kind of crappy, but if I go and I landmine press with like an alternate arm reach, it generally feels better. Like, I don't think that that impact is purely mediated just through muscular recruitment. I think there are probably multiple systems involved that we really don't understand. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And, and, and going back to that, you know, efficiency of, you know, uh, you know, you have these guys that are uh, someone like, you know, Garam, who's, who's, you know, maybe really efficient in transferring that energy. Uh, he's also moving, you know, in this like very triplanar, you know, movement. And he's very, maybe he's very efficient, you know, triplanar, maybe those fascial lines going through the body are just way more efficient, but the, uh, you know, something I'm hopeful of, at least from the Proteus uh, standpoint, is that we're going to be helpful in training that because if you do a split stance, you know, PNF on Proteus, it is a very challenging experience compared yeah. to doing that in, with other types of implements. Yeah. And part of that yeah. is teaching someone to, you know, transfer that energy from the ground all the way up to their hand. We actually call it the, the Proteus stumble when someone first yeah. does the yeah. trunk rotation or like a PNF the first time and they're not used yeah. to that they have to you know get rebalanced it really forces them to kind of be be grounded so yeah. um you know I'm hopeful that you know maybe if you took put him on uh, uh one mm-hmm. of these tests I'd be curious to see how he do compared to people you know yeah. you know of, of uh you know that are maybe smaller than him or or whatever it'd be kind of interesting yeah. um well, Eric, you know, hey, we're coming up on time and I want to uh, be respectful of your time. So I think it's time for what we're calling the Proteus Power Questions. So right. these are kind of like our rapid fire questions. Uh, just kind of give me your best answer if you got one. And then, uh, you know, after that, I want everyone to know where they can find you and learn more about you. Sure. So you ready? Yeah. Let's do it. All right, let's go. So first one. What is the biggest gimmick you've seen in the fitness industry in the last few years? Oh, wow. The biggest one, you know, I, I'm not going to give you a, a specific gimmick. I'll, I'll, I'll say that the fitness industry's collection over the last probably five, 10 years of, of rehashed ideas, you know what I mean? Like things that, things okay. that we've, we've, you know, we've seen it for an extended period of time with like, you know, stuff that was around in the early 1900s that now is revitalized and repackaged and all that. So, you know, most of the stuff that we're encountering today is, is old stuff, just packaged and new. Yeah. Um, so I, I will say, you know, one I'm, I'm really tired of is the, um, the fake range of motion improvements. Like you've seen them, you have, you have a background in PRI, like, yep. you, you know, this yep. happens all the time. Right. So yep. you can, you can cook numbers really, really easily by, yep. you know, for measuring shoulder internal rotation, like whether you stabilize the scapula, if you're measuring ER, like, do you posteriorly glide the humeral head? Do you, yep. you posteriorly tilt the scapula? Do you control for elbow valgus? Rib cage, so, that yes. rib cage moves, the scapula exactly. moves. Yep. And so I see it all the time. People who will like test somebody and then they'll do some kind of intervention and then they'll go back and they'll retest them in a different way that'll show 20 degrees more range of motion. Yeah. It's like, it's just, it's, it's, it's bad business. I, that drives yeah. me bonkers. So that's my biggest gimmick. How's that? I like it. I like it. Great answer. Great answer. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't lose too much sleep about this stuff though. For yeah, no. Good. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. So what piece of equipment do you wish you had that you don't? Ooh. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in, in Yankees world. I pretty much have everything I could possibly <laughs> need um you know i I think yeah i think that's that's the man who has everything no that's that's the amazing thing about being a little larger our larger sports franchise particularly in the context of rehab stuff and and all those side of things i i think you know um you know in the in the private sector you know i think any kind of uh, aquatic scenarios you know like hot cold pools um Uh, under, underwater treadmills for for rehabbing for athletes after you know surgical interventions all that stuff it's in the private sector, it's just a nightmare to take care of. 
Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean, like you know, you, you're talking about like cryo chambers or sensory deprivation tanks or anything like that. <clears throat> All these pro sports and, and some of the college is obviously are are very well equipped with large support staff and tons of just square footage to handle it. In the private sector, like you can you can crunch the numbers every which way, and it's just like impossible to to you know basically justify having like hot and cold tubs yeah because you're just like terrified of like if you don't meticulously take care of them like someone's gonna get you know sick or an infection or or right. you know yeah. athlete's foot or something like that you just you don't want to take it on even though like they do seem to be really really helpful for athletes especially when you got these million dollar bodies right you gotta be that's it <laughs> yeah and there's, i mean there's lawsuits of athletes who've had MRSA you know because these equipment or facilities weren't taken care of well so it's just a layer of complexity that like if you're gonna do it you have to have like a very large support staff that you know is very much assigned to that but yeah i think i think having more aquatic elements would be would be nice Oh, nice. I love it. Great answer. Instead, instead we have the beach. At, at yeah, yeah, I'm about to say you're not, you know, you're not yeah. that far away from us. Yeah. And stuff. most most people in Florida have pools in some capacity at their fingertips. So they can do their underwater running and things like that there. <laughs> oh man, the good life down there. Um, so what are your okay, here's here's one. I'll be curious how you, where you go with this one. What are your top five favorite exercises? You know, Proteus or not. And in fact, I sometimes I've done this with some people. Give me your top five Proteus and your top five other, but or, or just your top five total. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this in a non-traditional way. I hate I hate this question. Oh, I, and I, hey, I'm fine yeah, with that. Worst question ever. And, and the reason was <laughs> I remember distinctly being on a panel in like Washington D.C. This is like 2007, and they yeah. asked the question: If you could only pick one exercise for the rest of your mm. life, what would it be? It's like I don't have to. Like, why would that ever be the case? Like. <laughs> regardless of these things. so like I, i'll i'll answer by saying like the basics still work right you know yeah squat hinge row push lunge and then rotate you know and, and as we've talked about on this you know you can you can rotate a million different ways love um, it yeah hey, you can, and we've had scenarios like with rotation like we've done three days a week of like proteus and three days a week of med ball and i've been shocked at how well athletes handle it like people who yeah. really need to train it it's that's 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 a that's a good takeaway from this question. How is it that that you can train rotation way harder than you ever thought you could? Um, and what people don't realize is walking with arm swing is rotation. Like sprinting is a yes, great sir. rotation exercise. Any kind of reciprocal action drives reciprocal alternating yeah. movement. Yeah. It's the that, key to life. <laughs> those patterns are good. Like what what um, you, you you'll see it all the time. People who walk slowly. People that walk while, while holding like dog leashes with no arm uh -huh. swing, they have to actually feel worse after the walk in many cases yeah. because they don't swing their arms or get like the, the yep. reciprocal action they need. So, yeah. You know, obviously like, because of my PRI background, yeah. I catch it all the time, even on myself. I'm like, well, wait a minute, I need to start swinging those arms. <laughs> yeah, it's big. It makes a big difference. Especially you know? when we talk about like, you know, athletes that are really like heavily in scapular depression and those, those arms, you know, they weigh a lot. Um, so you can create a yeah. lot of challenges if they're not like pumping the system. Well, Maybe yours weigh a lot. Right? <laughs> I don't these, that these don't weigh that much. <laughs> uh, all right. So, all right. How about this one then? Who's your favorite athlete of all time and why? Ooh, I, I grew up, a, a, believe it or not, a big Barry Sanders fan. Uh, I, was, Come I, on, I, I, still, I still have my Barry Sanders replica jersey. Heck yeah. Um, that, was, uh, that was fun to watch. So I was, a, I was a, a, a pretty hopeless Detroit Tigers fan. Um, for <laughs> not Tigers, excuse me, Detroit Lions. Lions, um, Lions, yeah. Yeah, and every once in a while it'd be awkward because our, you know, I'm, I'm a Patriots fan to this day. I was really a Barry Sanders fan, and I want to say there were like a couple years where they played the Patriots, and I didn't really know what to do. But yeah, um, I was a big, big Barry Sanders fan. <laughs> I mean, dude, he's human joystick. Yep. Um. So, all right, give advice. I, I know you've been asked this one probably before yeah. in other podcasts, but give advice yeah. to a young Eric Cressy just starting his career. What would you What would you tell a young Eric Cressy just starting out? Um, understand scale sooner. I'll, I'll give you an awesome example um, because I think about this actually relatively frequently. When I was when I was at UConn, um, I had some some great mentors. Um, you know, Chris West was there. He was he was awesome. He had men's, women's basketball and soccer. Tina Murray, um, you know, who's who's done amazing things at Louisville and the Sacramento Kings. Um, actually, she's back in the NHL now. She was a, a great mentor to me. And um, I actually had a brief chance to, to kind of work under Andrea Hooty, um, who was at UConn for the double national championship for men's and women's basketball. And then she went to Texas, she went to Kansas, and she's actually back at UConn with women's basketball there. Um, and only had a, a brief stint with, with, with Hooty um, while I was there. But I just think I remember when our, our men's basketball team, like this is the, the national championship guys were back in 
after they had won, it was kind of transitioning from like spring to like summer period, you know, the guys that were going to be around on campus. And I was like, you know, ready to take on the world first year grad student. I knew everything. I read every, you know, research article on the planet. And we had actually done some of the, the research on creatine in our um, lab, like not, not so much like researching it, but like writing up a meta-analysis saying like, this is safe. And I'll distinctly remember one of our men's basketball guys asked me, he's like, Hey, what do you got on creatine? And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm the smart kid that, you know, I'm, I'm coveted by an athlete. He wants my information. I'm just, the, <laughs> you know, the little intern in the corner. And I was like, you know, it's the most research supplement in history. They're using it with astronauts and space flight. Like I've been on it myself for this many years. It, it can do this, this, and this like, great. And he was like, cool. And, you know, he's like, I should, I should definitely get going with it. So, you know, I'm like, I, I did my job. Right. Yeah. And, and Hootie to her credit, like she, she kind of overheard the conversation. She blow me up in front of the athlete, which in and of itself showed like what a pro she was. She <laughs> understood it. And she pulled me aside and she was like, Hey, just so you know, like we have, we have dietitians on staff here at UConn. We generally refer those, those questions to them just because we work as a part of a team and we want to make sure that everybody is looped in on these discussions. And, you know, I, I, I was like, Oh, you know, I'm sorry. And I, I just didn't think like that. Right. I thought that, advancing in this world was all about just being progressive and having knowledge and all that stuff. And, and now, um, you know, here, here I am, I mean, that was 2003. So we're talking about 19 years later. Um, you know, I, I realized, you know, I'm, I'm a director of, a, of an organization, director of, um, or, or a, a, a department in an organization, director of two facilities. And what you quickly realize is that ascending to these roles of leadership is not just about what, you know, it's about, um, how you manage systems, how you lead people, and then and certainly how you scale all of it. I mean, right. so many, so many young coaches that think it's so much more about just being progressive, about going to more seminars, reading more books, coming up with the latest, greatest exercises and doing that. And it's actually way more about how do you empower the people around you? Mm. Um, how do you set them up for success, knowing that you'll never be the only one around all the time? Like that athlete's right. going to be without you at some point. How Impossible. do you educate them? And so I, I, I wish I had known how to scale things faster then, because it would have made me successful, not just in training athletes, but it would have made me a better mentor to staff. It would have allowed me to, to grow our business differently. It would have allowed me to design systems um, that I think served both our staff and our clients better. So I'm, I'm very, very mindful of scale. Now I've over 40 employees across my different roles in, in multiple states, multiple countries, actually, um, mm. that are underneath my departments. And, and a lot of my my work uh, regarding scale has been hiring great people that understand it as well so i think there's there's probably a bunch of like young coaches that that are going to listen to this that think it's just about being smart and it's so much more about how you design systems that that allow you to be successful <clears throat> three you know five seven years from now i love it man that is a great advice and a great answer um and, and, and I totally see, especially when someone as busy as you, yeah. you have to have, a, you can't be at all those places at the same time. It, it's yeah. not possible. So, um, okay. So last one, uh, besides this podcast, and of course your own, what's your favorite podcast that you listen to, or give me your couple of favorites. Oh yeah. A couple of good ones. Um, you know, so I listen across different distances. I, Mike Robertson's a close friend. I always listen to Mike's stuff. Um, yeah, I love his podcast. It's really, really good. You just um, had Mike, him on, actually, didn't you? Yeah, Mike. Mike finally, we did a, a home and home. I was on his, and then he came on mine. So Mike's <laughs> great. I, I will be a loyal Proteus listener now that now that we actually have something in the works. Um, I actually really like Adam Grant's, you know, kind of organizational behavior um, okay. stuff, which I think is really, really good. Um, Adam actually was really helpful when I first took the Yankees job. Um, uh, Maria Sharapova was a mutual friend um, who connected us. And Adam was very gracious in his time, wow. and, you know, gave me you know, some really good insights that I think have helped us to, to scale our operation here well and, and then build out a, a really good culture. So I, I really owe Adam a debt of gratitude. So enjoy his. Those are, um, those are ones that are, that are definites for me. Um, Lee Taft has had a good one for a while. I think Lee's stuff on the speed development side is, is really, really good if you're looking at the training side of things. And then, yeah. you know, like I'll do a lot of, um, you know, entrepreneurial stuff. Um, Masters of Scale, um, you know, how I built this, or built kind this. of kind of classics that are out there. Um, so, I, you know, I'm a little bit more of an audiobook guy than I, I probably am um, podcast, oh. but but I, I mix and match between the two. Nice, nice. I'm I'm becoming, you know, it's one of those things with audiobooks. I I uh, I'm definitely podcast uh, what I listen to the most, but then yep. 
audiobooks that's like they come and go one catch my interest yep. and i will i will drop all podcasts for like you know two weeks or whatever yep. however long it takes crush an audiobook and then i'll go back and i won't listen to an audiobook for like <laughs> for yeah, a while but it's interesting i set a goal every year that i want to i want to basically get through 25 audiobooks and then uh, 52 podcasts so basically a podcast a week um, oh nice and and so for the most part you know, like I'll, I'll blow the podcast more on the water and come in like right at 25, but actually I'm, I'm listening to more like baseball podcasts, like, uh, like David Cohen actually just did a really good job with towing the slab as a new baseball one. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty cool. good. And then, um, CC Sabathia's new podcast is, is, is pretty solid. We'll have players on and, you know, sometimes awesome. they're, they're players that we train and, um, you know, you just hear them have a conversation with someone else and it's it sometimes, you know, clicks a little bit better. Um, Sio Bloom actually has a great podcast called Where It Happens, um, which which I like as well. So I listen to a lot, a lot of different stuff. It keeps me busy. Man, that's a lot of good material out there. So for everyone listening, they'll be able to uh, add a lot more to their queue. So get lost in it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, hey, uh, you know, before we sign off, you know, how do people find you? You know, how do they reach out to you? What, what's the best way to follow what Eric Cressy's doing? Yeah, pretty much ericcressy.com, E-R-I-C-C-R-E-S-S-E-Y.com is the website. That's for like the podcast and, you know, all my blogs and products and speaking engagements, all that stuff is centered. And then it's just at Eric Cressy on Twitter, Instagram. Um, you can find everything. You know, oh man. And, and we didn't even get into like sturdy shoulders or your, your thoracic mm -hmm. outlet course that yeah. you just did. I mean, uh, there's, I assume all that information's on there, right? Yeah, they can find it all right up there. Oh man. Great. Great. Well, Eric, thank you so much for taking the time on your busy schedule. We even went a little longer than I planned. So oh, I really good. appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be uh, seeing you very, very soon. My pleasure guys. Thank you very much. And, and best of luck with the podcast. Thanks man. Talk to you soon. Bye -bye.